a wonderful <laughs> friend and, and colleague, and we've done great things together before on tracing gannet and things, but I'm just going to read this out. So Ruth is a geologist specialising in the study of minerals and rocks used in cultural heritage. She has worked extensively on the characterisation and analysis, analysis of artist pigments, ceramics and building materials, including mortars, bricks and stone. She's a co-author of the book Pigment Com The Pigment Compendium and is actively engaged in earth science-related outreach. She collaborated in research studying materiality with colleagues at UF UCL Slade School of Art. She regularly leads guided walks unveiling the geological sources of London's and other provincial spaces, their built heritage. <laughs> So, yeah, we're really thrilled. Who told you that? But I'm, I'm, I'm making it up, Ruth. I'm just making it up. No, it's official. It's, yeah. it's official. It's written down. So, yeah, um, Ruth is a really special friend, an amazing kind of fount of knowledge that we can kind of really, she's going to sort of share with you today. And, and I think Ruth and, Han Hai and I had a really good conversation about the value of geological knowledge in its kind of purest form and then that how, how that kind of reaches into the world. So... I'm going to hand over to Ruth, my friend and fount of knowledge. <laughs> Thank you, David. Can you hear me? Is this working? Because I can't tell from where I am. Getting nods from the back. That's a good sign. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. And, and thank you, Therese and Kat and Cast and all the lovely food. What a fantastic <laughs> time to be here. It really is good to come down again and, and be part of this great project. And um, yes, yeah, so thank you. And um, as David mentioned in his introduction, um, I am a geologist. I, I work on cultural heritage and, you know, and I've kind of been through this, I don't know, defining what I do, you know, and I went through a period of call, calling myself a conservation scientist, as in working for people who are conserving works of art or buildings, a geo-archaeologist, and, and in the end I'm just, you know, I just self-identify as a geologist. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do, and those, that's the knowledge base I use in order to understand materials, and those are the skills that I employ to, to do this. And, you know, David again also mentioned I do a lot of work with the uh, Slay School of Fine Art. I'm, my home institution is University College London. And that's our art school, our art department. Um, and they have this fantastic scheme of scientists in residence. I'm sure you've all have heard of artists in residence, but we have scientists in residence at the Slade, and I was uh, the second person to hold that role. And, um, and this is relevant for tonight's talk because part of, part of that role meant that I had to give a seminar series to the students. And um, I've worked worked in pigments, I've worked with fine art, I've worked in archaeological painting. So I was trying to kind of make what I was talking about relevant to fine art students and, you know, bring that art side into things. So I gave a couple of talks and at the end of the second one, a group of students came up to me and said, don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed your talk, <laughs> Dr. Siddall, but can you just teach us science? So that's what I'm going to do tonight, whether you like it or not. <laughs> I'm going to teach you about granite. <coughs> Let me just get that onto full screen. What have we done now? Oh no, there we go. Wow. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, a lot of the things that David and I are interested in is, you know, what what is granite? How do we shape it? How do we use it in cultural heritage? You know, and it's incredibly um, important material. And I'm going to I'm going to talk about you know life on Earth is, is you know we we're, we're here because we have a granite planet. So I'm going to talk about the shapes of real granites and bring that round to how we shape granite and use it. So what is granite? So I bet you all, you, you know, most of you will live locally and you'll know about granite because this is granite country. Um, Cornwall is really the main part of England with granite. Now you might not want to be part of England, totally get that. But um, <laughs> the only other place where granites are quarried in England are in Leicestershire. And then they're all quite crumbly, so you can only get blocks about so big out of them and the the biggest oops, the biggest quarries they used to be the biggest quarries in Europe in Leicester but you can only use them for cobblestones and curbstones because you can only get small blocks out of them. 
Um, the only places that you can get dimension stone size blocks that you can build a lighthouse out or a dock or use as foundations for <coughs> University College London, for example, my home institution, is Cornwall, but also Shap in Cumbria. Uh, and otherwise, you know, granite comes from elsewhere. It comes from Ireland, it comes from Scotland, it comes from uh, continental Europe, it comes from further afield. So granite is quite simply defined as a, a granular igneous rock, and that's where the name comes from, granum in Latin, gave us the name granite, just meaning grain, made out of grains, granular. And so we can see a piece of uh, Oparino granite here from uh, North Wales. Actually, this granite sits right on the border of northern Portugal and uh, Galicia in Spain. And hopefully we can see that, you know, it's a rock is, uh, is defined as being made of a selection of minerals. And what, that's what we're looking at here. So we can see this pink mineral. We can see this grey mineral. And we can see these black flecks in it. There are three major minerals in this rock. And these three major minerals are the standard recipe for granite. Quartz, which is grey here. Feldspar, which is pink and slightly yellowish on occasion. And the black is a mineral called mica, a variety of mica called biotite. So this mixture of quartz, mica, feldspar geologically defines the granite. I don't know why that says restricted at the bottom. Did the other sides have so restricted on it? I never put that there. <laughs> That's a bit odd. Anyway, it's not restricted. Um, so we've got a hand specimen view of a granite on, on the left hand side, and we can see the pink and white is feldspar. Uh, the black, which is quite dominant, is, is uh, the mica and then grey quartz again. And it's the quartz that really gives granite its toughness and its strength and its hardness. Uh, so quartz is an essential component of granite. Other igneous rocks are available, but not all of them contain quartz. And this is what granite looks like under the micro microscope. The grey is feldspar. Actually, and the grey is also quartz. Um, can't really tell them apart very well on that image. And the, the brown, foxy brown coloured stuff is, is the mica. <coughs> so, granites are intrinsic to our planet and the fact that we have continents surrounded by water. And so this cartoon shows plate tectonic settings that you can form granites in. So our planet is unique in the solar system and that it has this phenomenon called plate tectonics, where the, um, the Earth's crust and the upper part of the mantle, uh, which is in sort of greeny grey on this image, um, moves around slowly but surely. So, for example, uh, the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, there is a, one of these kind of scenarios, this one here in the Mid-Atlantic, and the Mid-Atlantic is moving apart about the rate that our fingernails grow. So slowly but significantly. And we can divide the Earth's surface into two types of crust. So either continental crust, like the Mid-Atlantic, like the Atlantic Ocean, which is this kind of greeny, grey, thin crust. This is oceanic crust. An oceanic crust is defined as being young, dense, young and dense, really. I'm <laughs> <laughs> <And> hot. <laughs> In contrast, our planet uniquely has substantial amount of continental crust, which is dominantly made of granites. And continental crust, again, in contrast to oceanic crust, is old, cold, <laughs> and stable, and buoyant. So you can almost think of it, it's a bit simplistic to say, but it's reasonable to, to think of it floating on the mantle. And it's thick as well, it's much, much thicker than oceanic crust. And it, it's predominantly made out of granites, it's certainly the lower parts of it. So you do get granites in oceanic setting, but, but out of um, quite difficult to understand geochemical processes where um, the granite um, kind of segregates out of other types of melts. Um, quartz is very rare in these environments, 
And so when you do get to granite for forming, they're really small. In contrast, the con continental crust is quartz rich. Quartz, as, is, as I said earlier, is the essential component of granite. Loads of quartz in there, loads of granite. So we're standing on continental crust here, and we know that there are <coughs> granites in the local vicinity, but you know, there, there are granites at depth pretty much everywhere. So this map of the world shows contours on the thickness of crust. So oceanic crust is predominantly less than 10 kilometres thick. You know, what's that distance to, how far away is Falmouth? About that, isn't it? Yeah, so not, not far. You do not want to drill through that, though. Continental crust varies in thickness, and I've marked the, the place where continental crust is the thinnest, which is in the basin and range, places like Death Valley in, uh, in the Colorado Plateau, North America. Uh, and continental crust is extremely thin there, 16 kilometers thick. On the other extreme, underneath the Himalayas, we've, we've got the thickest continental crust, and it's 72 kilometers thick. And indeed, actually, if you could add the, the top of the mantle to that, which is part of the plate, it's about 100 kilometers thick. And so it's no surprise. And again, you know, you see other areas that are red on this map, you know, other areas very thick continental crest underneath the Andes. These are associated with actively forming mountain belts. And that's important because we need thick crust to form granite. Now, I also said that continental crust is old. It is. Most of the oceanic, all the oceanic crust is younger than Jurassic in age. So, you know, younger than, I don't know, 180 million years, something like that only. <laughs> Whereas most of the continental crust is about one billion years old. So significant order of magnitude uh, older. And we know this from these marvellous little minerals which are called zircons, which we get in granites. The things about zircons is they have incredibly high melting temperatures. So while rocks are being recycled through the continental crust, um, they go through phases of melting and cooling and solidification, but temperatures are rarely high enough to completely melt away zircons. So you get, and I'll show you some more pictures of these in a, in a few slides, you get layers of zircon growth, zirconium silicate, forming on these crystals. And this is a really important crystal, which is 50 micron, well, about, it's about, probably about 150 microns or so diameter, 200 <coughs> microns diameter. Um, that's 0.2 of a millimeter, tiny, 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 a micron is a millionth of a meter. And <coughs> using technology, high resolution iron microprobes, you can analyze each zone in this crystal and find out how old it is. And that's because zircons trap uranium, which we can use as a geological clock, as a geochronometer. And this zircon here, in this area, <coughs> gave the oldest radiometric age that has ever been found on our planet, which is 4.4 billion years, 4,404 million years old. Now, we know the age of the universe is just a little bit older, so not the universe, sorry, the solar system, the solar system. The universe is about 15 billion years old, uh, formed on Wednesday about tea time. <laughs> <laughs> but our solar system is about four and a half billion years old, and we know that from meteorite fragments that have landed on Earth and we've been able to date. Most importantly, uh, a meteorite called the Allende meteorite, which landed in Pueblo de Allende in Mexico in the 1960s, I think. And it was quite a large meteorite. Most meteorites burn up on entry into Earth. There was quite a lot of Allende meteorite, and enough to be shared across many different labs across the world and, uh, and analysed. And it gives a consistent age, <coughs> excuse me. Excuse me, yeah. It gives a consistent age of about 4.5 billion years. So we can, and looking at that material under the microscope, we can see it's made up of lumps of rock, bits of metal, junk, space dust that all kind of glued together. You know, it's the mess of the solar system before it coalesced into planets as we know it today. But, you know, 100 million years later, which is a blink of an eye geologically, 
We've got solid crust. We've got evidence of crust, and not only evidence of crust, granites on Earth. So our planet had formed, and we now think, you know, that our planet formed in about 100 million years, which is really, really quick. You may not think so, but it is. So this is a really important little zircon that tells us that we have we've had granites for four and a half billion years. It's pretty amazing, and therefore we've had continental crust four and a half billion years. We don't have this on Venus or Mars or any of the other rocky planets, only on Earth. Only Earth, of course, has plate tectonics as well. So this is a science bit. This is a diagram which shows pressure descending with depth on the vertical <coughs> axis and temperature increasing on the horizontal axis. So as you dig deeper into the Earth, it gets hotter, you know that. And if you've heard anything about geothermal energy, you know that. And most rocks, if they're buried, the relationship between temperature and pressure is linear. So a rock would take, starting at the origin, that corner, will take a straight line at some angle across this diagram. And temperature of 1,000 degrees is significant because that is the temperature of the base of the crust, or the top of the mantle, depending on which way you want to look at it. And that is whether you're on oceanic crust or continental crust. So, you know, within 10 kilometres out in the middle of the Atlantic, rocks are 1,000 degrees. That's, that's why you don't want to drill through uh, oceanic crust. But we have to go much, much deeper. So, you know, where we stand in now, it's about 30 kilometres down to the top of the mantle. So relatively, relatively thick crust, average crust thickness, to be honest. So this is where granites come in. Now, and also, to bring it back to the whole theme of water and stone, this is where water comes in, which is another unique thing that our planet has in abundance. There may be planet in, uh, water in the form of ice on other planets and planetoids, and moons in the solar system, but not a lot of it. We have lots of water on our planet. Most of the Earth's surface is covered in water. We need water to make granites melt in continental crust because this red line here, um, it's called a liquidus, everything my side of the red line, to the right of the red line, will be a melt. But that is temperatures in excess of 1,000 degrees. You can only get those in the mantle, you can't get them in the crust because 1000 degrees C is the top of the mantle. So in theory, to melt granite, you need temperatures of 1000 degrees, you can't get them in crustal temperatures, but you can because we've got water in the crust and that shifts this line right over here. And that is just the presence of water. So granites don't form in the mantle because they're not in the right composition. Mm -hmm. Okay, a few small ones do, but they are abundant in the crust only because we have water in the crust. So this is what we call the wet melting curve <laughs> in geology, um, you know, because it tells us that granites can form in continental crust. And most rocks, when they're bur buried, will take geotherm, a pressure temperature pathway, which basically goes, could do with a, a pointer really, is there a pointer? No, you just have to imagine, basically starting at OO at the top left corner there and just coming at an angle of about 45 degrees C right through this map. Um, so you will go through a zone where rocks become solid and then become metamorphosed, transport, which means they've been transformed by increasing temperatures and pressure and then they will start, some of them, some of them will start to melt as they cross this red line, the wet melting curve. Now to actually see these, this is theoretical, obviously, we can't go 20 kilometres, 5 kilometres, any that kind of distance down in the crust. The, the deepest crustal borehole, I think it's 12 kilometres, it's on the Kola Peninsula in Arctic Russia, um, and the crust is quite thick there. You know, but we can't, we can't drill into molten rock, and we don't want to either. That would not be a good idea, because it would all melt out, and yeah. 
Um, <laughs> but in places where we get rapid uplift of rocks, we can freeze processes that are going on in the deeper crust because they're being shifted up to the upper crust quickly and frozen in time. So we can get a snapshot of what is going on in the deep crust. And in places like the Himalayas and the Andes and indeed the Alps, and even in places like Scotland where you know there's 450 million year old mountain belts, we see rocks that look like this. Um, this actually is in South Africa, in the Cape Granite, and these are rocks that are called migmatites. Uh, and this process geologically, or in terms of granite, petrogenesis, formation of granite, is called segregation. And what is happening here is that the paler coloured material is starting to melt. The dark coloured material isn't melting, and we can still see in that relics of geological structures like banding. And the paler colour material is made out of our old friends, quartz, feldspar and mica, which are the three of the eight or so major rock-forming minerals. The other major rock-forming minerals are things like amphiboles, pyroxenes, olivines, garnet. Well, there's calcite, but that's limestone, so that's different. But the black stuff is made up of pyroxenes, olivines, garnets, essentially, in this case. And they don't melt until much, much higher temperatures. They will melt at crystal, sorry, at top mantle temperatures. Thank you, Lisa. Look at that. So we should have gone back. I'm going to go, just because I've got it, I'm going to go back to show you the average crystal ge geotherm. It goes straight like that. So a rock getting buried will follow the line of this cane of bamboo. Normally. So what we're looking at here on that diagram is going on around this boundary <coughs> at depth. So we're going from solid rock to partially molten rock. And then we've lifted it up and frozen that in action. So this is starting to melt. This is still solid. And it's often called, so granulite is kind of metamorphic rock, uh, a rock that has been transformed by high heat and pressure in this high grade region. And that's not melting at all, that's just staying there. It's resting. We call it restite because of that. Just stick it out on the end of anything, you've got rock <laughs> um, But this is starting to melt. And here's another picture I just picked out of uh, my Brown's papers, uh, which should show other examples of um, these rocks that are called migmatites, rocks that preserve this evidence of partial melting. And you can kind of see it's starting to go. The white material, the pale material, is starting to coalesce into blobs and layers. And this is our granite melt forming. Now, how do granites form then? So this is segregation. The next two processes are ascent of the granite through the Earth's crust and its emplacement, its final destination, usually around about five kilometres deep into the crust. Now, top shows this cl the classic diapir model. So you get this melt forming, um, because it's hot, it's more buoyant than cold rock, and it rises like a balloon, and ends up like a kind of flattish balloon in place in the upper crust. So this is what I was taught as an undergraduate years ago and we no longer believe this this is rubbish um, so this is kind of think of your your classic lava lamp you know the blobs going up that's basically what this is coming from and and a lot of these ideas came from the observed shapes of granite so here's the um, Flamonville granite which is in uh, near Cherbourg on the Cotentin Peninsula of Normandy in France and you know it's kind of got a balloon shape to it, you know? And we'll, I'll show you other maps of granites. So they are blob-shaped. Somebody thought, well, that must be the shape. But, but no. We now have a better understanding, and this is mainly from going and looking at big mountains and looking at migmatites, these kind of partially molten rocks, that we get basically granites forming in the lower continental crust, starting to melt, 
partially melting to extract granitic melts from rocks of mixed chemistry. And then the ascent is actually probably through quite thin fractures, and it may pond for times in the middle crust. And then finally, you'll get emplacement of quite a tabular-shaped body, not a balloon-shaped diapir. It's very different, difficult to see the bottoms of granites. I don't mean that in a... Don't, don't even go there with that <laughs> sort. Uh, the base of granite. So this is a picture of Everest, or Nupsi actually, part of the Everest range in the Himalayas. And this tells us some of this story. We have the Nupsi granite here, which is Miocene in age, so it's about 40 million years old. It's quite young, uh, very typical for the age of the formation of the Himalayas. Um, and these mountains have been uplifted incredibly rapidly because India is slamming northwards into stable Asia and hasn't stopped. It should have stopped, but it hasn't stopped, nobody knows why, and the Himalayas are still going up. But this is fantastic in this north face of Nupsi. You know, we've got a good kilometre of exposure here, and we can see all these, this stock work, this veining. This is all granite forming in pipes and sheets. And this really... You know, and there would have been granites above that that have now been eroded away. So this is effectively this process that is going on. And we can see it only in these... I mean, let's see, third highest mountain in the world? I'm looking at you, Catherine. <laughs> Something like that, you know, super high. Um, so it's only in these kind of mountains that you can see this. And the kind of geologists that were coming up with the diapiric rising magmas were coming up with it. You know, in the 1940s and 50s, people weren't going to big mountains like this then, or certainly geologists weren't going to big mountains like this then. So this is classic Himalayan granite. The Himalaya have formed as a result of India slamming into Eurasia, Asia, and it's what we call continent-continent collision as a result of this. And there was no surface volcanism associated with these granites. There can be, but not in this case. They just sat in the crust and stayed there. And that is probably the case with the Cornish granites as well. They formed during continent-continent collision 300 million years ago. So Himalayan-type granites. But this is much younger and uplifting much, much faster than the crust in um, Cornwall ever did. So this is Manga Parbat. Manga Parbat is, I think, the eighth highest mountain in the world. It's still an eight-kilometre peak. Um, it's in northwest Pakistan, northwest frontier province. This is the Indus Gorge on the other side of this cliff. And we're on the other side looking across to Nanga Parbat. And can't see the bottom of the Indus Gorge because it's down there. But there is seven kilometres of vertical exposure. And there is nothing else like that anywhere else on our planet, except in the deep, deep ocean trenches. So, you know, you take a run and jump off Nanga Parba, take a long time for you to hit the bottom. They're also the steepest slopes on our planet as well. Actually, Rakaposhi, which is the next mountain up, sort of off the picture that way, has got the steepest, steepest slope in the world, a one in eight slope. Um, so this is a good place to look at <coughs> granite, and it's also a good place to look at granite, because not only is it a very high mountain, it is a mountain that we know is being uplifted at one of the fastest rates on the planet as well. It's going up to about a centimetre a year still, and it's been doing that for about 20 million years. And of course, that increase in height is being tempered by erosion. So we're not getting, the mountain's not getting bigger and bigger because the higher it gets, the more it gets eroded. So this is one of the most amazing stretches on the planet, in my opinion. And this is a fault, more or less along that line. And this dark rock is about two billion years old. It's quite old. These white rocks, 10,000 years old. 
They're on the bottom, this is on the top, so what's going on there? And this is a major fault, which is shifting seven kilometres of rock, including Nangapaba, on top of river gravels that were laid down in the Neolithic. <laughs> so this has happened incredibly rapidly. There is nowhere else, apart from the New Zealand Alpine Fault, there's nowhere else you see tectonics of this sort happening. And they're not as obvious in the New Zealand Alpine Fault because the movement's kind of like that. But in the Himalayas, the movement is like that. So that's, that's the Indus River gravels and Mangapaba has been overthrust on top of it. But look, these white streaks. These are granites that are starting to melt. And they're kind of in stripes in this black gneiss. So they've been frozen in the process of melting. I'll show you another picture of the same structure. So the fault across there. And this is a nice bit further along strike, a bit higher at the Indus Gorge, same structure though. And we can see these planar layers of granite sitting in the knife. So observations of places like this, and I'm going to come back to this because it's an even more amazing story, is that we kind of start to understand that granites are not balloon shaped, they're flat, they're tablet shaped. And we also have amazing exposures like the Torres del Paña in the southern Andes in Patagonia, where we can actually see a really, really small granite intrusion. You know, it looks quite big, but it's a tiddler. Tiny compared to the granites we're standing on. Um, well, we've got about a kilometre thick, nothing, sheet of granite, which has this kind of shape. And because it's so well exposed by glaciation, we get a really good handle on the shape. So there's black mice above it, black mice below it, and this pale brownish granite forming this sheet, which simplified looks like that. So let's go back to our little zircons, that is this mineral that is found in trace amounts in granite that concentrates uranium, and we can date our rocks. So this is just a very pretty picture of a very nicely zoned zircon. And we can analyze, as I said, individual grains, but not only that, individual layers, individual zones in these grains to get ages. And this is just an example um, of some zircon ages where we can see this is just from one rock type of sandstone um, in southern Africa. You know, we're getting a whole mixture of ages. So some with the cores, the oldest bits, about 600 million years, with 500 million year old overgrowth. But, you know, there are others, you know, with almost 2 billion year old cores and 500 million year overgrowth. There's clearly a story here of 500 million year recrystallisation, or thereabouts, 489, whatever. So this, these granites have been, sorry, these zircons have been through granites and maybe ended up in a sandstone following erosion of those granites, which show at least two phases of crystallisation. Yeah, oh, well, some about 600 million years ago, some about 200 million years ago, but then a, a second phase around 475 or so million years ago. So let's go back to oops, these granites, these sheets above this thrust fault in northwest frontier province in, Japan, in uh, Japan, Pakistan. And we have cores that represent the age of the black nice, about 2 billion years old, 1,850 million years old. And like those granites formed 2 million years ago and have since been lifted up. So they would have formed 30, 40, 50 kilometres down in Himalayan Clerk crust. And over the last three, three million years, that has all been uplifted. So astonishing stories of vertical movement in our crust, all reflected in granites. We understand how our crust works because of granites. So let's look at the other type of granite, Andean type <coughs> magnetism. We mentioned Patagonia, Torres del Paine is down here. And we have a whole string of granites <coughs> in pink all along the west coast of Central and South America. 
And these are Andean type granites and they form as a result of ocean continent collision. So this ocean is trundling eastwards all the time, the Pacific, and it's being underdressed underneath young, buoyant South America. But there's no continent to collide with it. Don't look at map of the Pacific. Thousands of miles and nothing. There's no continent to hit it. So this kind of particular juxtaposition of our plates, oceanic crust underthrusting continental crust gives us massive volcanoes. And they are underlain by granites that fed volcanoes. So this is a nice cartoon of the uh, Peruvian coastal range Batholith, which is this one. And this is built up from field mapping and geophysics. And it shows these weird shaped, bridge shaped, and um, kind of, well, very strange shapes, what we call bell jar pl plutons, a bit like a glass cloche that you put over a plant. Um, and these are evidence of massive caldera collapse during the eruption of what are popularly known as supervolcanoes. So here's an example of a supervolcano. This is Vias Caldera in New Mexico, topographic image. We can see this caldera rim. This is about, it's only about 20 kilometers across. These can get up to 50 kilometers across. Yellowstone is that kind of order of magnitude. And then we've got some resurgent volcanic domes and cones in the middle of it. This is the uh, US um, ge Geological Survey cross-section. Now what we're just seeing here is the top, you know, a few hundred metres of crust really. Um, so we're not seeing down below to the granite, that's quite deep, that's about five kilometres down. This is only showing us a couple of kilometres. And this is all volcanic rocks. All this stripy colour stuff is volcanic rocks that have come out of this volcano, major pyroclastic flows, ashes and some lavas. Lavas are quite rare in these kind of eruptions. But you can see that there's basically this collapsed area of crust that has moved downwards along these faults. And this is a cartoon that demonstrates that. So when you get a supervolcano eruption, nobody wants to see one of those. Um, hasn't been one for a thousand, yeah, about a thousand years and hopefully we won't see one in our lifetime, because that will knock everything else into a cocktail, let me tell you. Um, basically, all this magma is erupted along these, this circular fissure, we're only seeing it in two dimensions, but this is a fissure that's going all the way around this volcano, and ejecting ash, therefore, and you can imagine this really erupting, like, you know, getting a big bottle of Coke and giving it a good shake, and then taking the top off, and it'll all shoot out as foam. That's what happens, it's exactly what happens, except it's not coke, it's silico polymer. And it all shoots out, <laughs> leaving a space in the crust into which the crust drops back. And so you end up with these kind of, and then over successive periods, you know, the magma can, gets buried, the magma can flow across the top, and you end up with these kind of jar-shaped plutons. So it's really <coughs> difficult. So, um, Los Alamos <coughs> Observatory is in the middle of Vice Caldera. Uh, so it's kind of a big interest in uh, North American geology to know if this will erupt again. And we don't know. Um, probably not for a while. I think the last <coughs> eruption was about 50,000 years ago, something like that. Um, let's see if it's up. It says a number on that. It's too blurry, I can't read it. But... So finding the magma chamber is quite deep, and we've got very, very poor imaging, which gives us an idea. So this is so-called teleseismic imaging, which is basically sending um, explosions through the crust and allowing, them, allowing the, the shock waves of those explosions to bounce off layers within the rock. But here, near the surface, we can see this ring fracture, and this is false coloured to show these features up. And then at depth, probably about four or five kilometres mm. deep, Get this saucer shape, and that's probably the magma chamber. Definitely not a balloon shape, much more of a saucer shape. That's the nearest we've come to analysing these kind of currently active, this is a currently active granite magma chamber. 
most of the time, we're restricted to looking at these things on the Earth's surface. This is Beth Simon's lovely map of Cornwall showing the tops of these granites, which are protruding above a greater mass called the Canubian Batholith. Now, all these different colours show different phases of intrusion. A bit like, you know, I'm going to go back to this, you know, hundreds, well not hundreds, but lots of phases of intrusion. Each different colour below the yellow mm -hmm. is a different granite, essentially. So lots and lots and lots of activity all coalescing together, amalgamating through what we call a batholith, which is the largest kind of granite intrusion. Individual intrusions are called stocks if they're less than a kilometre diameter, and plutons if they're between one kilometre and 50 kilometres in diameter. We don't really, our, our planet can't support granite plutons, thank God, greater than 50 kilometres in diameter. We haven't found any bigger than that sort of range. Oops, I've gone ahead of myself. So all of these granites, different phases of intrusion, just like that section I showed you through the coastal batholith, all connected at depth. And this is, I hope you can see, it's, kind of, it's quite a difficult thing to see. We can, hopefully you can see this is the outline of South Wales, Bristol Channel, Cornwall. This is the La Manche, the English Channel through the Scilly Islands. And this is a map using gravity as a geophysical method. Now, different rocks, hotter than others, and that affects their, the gravity, the pull of gravity on those rocks. And it's very, very subtle differences. It's shockingly difficult to do gravity surveys. But this is really interesting because it shows you the blue, these gravity lens that show that this... This is the extent of our Cornish granites, you know. So right through Cornwall, from Devon, Dartmoor here, right through Cornwall, through the Sillies, but right out. But not only that, there's another one here, the heat class batholith, which is under the sea completely. None of that is emergent. And then we've got Lundy. Now, heat class and Cornubian about 297-ish million years old. Uh, Lundy, much, much more recent, about 60 million years old, so it's completely unconnected. It's like completely <coughs> random, Lundy, so you better completely ignore it. But, um, you know, the interesting thing as well about these two huge batholiths is that they're lines, they're forming in straight lines. So there's got to be a structural control there. So the way the Earth moves around is also important for determining the shape <coughs> of granite. Now this is where I did my PhD, these are my home granites. Um, this is the American Massive Brittany and Normandy and Vendée in Western France, across the other side of the channel. And we've got about three phases of granite magnetism going on here. We've got these really dark red ones, which are about 600 million years old, and they're the same age as the granites on the Channel Islands. And then we've got two phases of granite injection around about 400 million years ago then about the same age as Cornish granites about 300 million years ago but there are also these major faults running through this area so-called North American she North American shear zone and South American shear zone and you can see that the granites have got been real really controlled by these faults and squashed into lozenge shapes so I showed you the Flamanville granite, which is the classic balloon. That's that one up there. It's a lovely granite, Flamanville. Very, very accessible. Nice. And um, it's miles away from any fault, so it's just a nice blob. And this is what gave people the idea that granites were balloon shaped. But these are completely different shape, lozenge shaped. We get a similar sort of thing going on in the in the Pyrenees as well. Um, this is a more complex than just the granite, it's got a number of different igneous rocks in it, but mainly granite, the Bordeaux, Luron, Pluton, and it's eye-shaped, and you can see regional compression there, there should be another arrow <coughs> moving in that direction from this side, and you know, this is how this has grown over time in a fault zone that is being sheared 
and opening a space in the crust that can be occupied by melt, by occupied by, be occupied by the granite. We get this amazing kind of ice-shaped structure. So lots of different controls on the shapes of granite. So it's not just how they're intruded, it's also where they're intruded. And because they're often intruded into places where there is huge amounts of deformation, that can play a big part. And there's really weird granite. This is an enormous batolith. Um, so batolith, a large mass of granite made up of multiple intrusions. Um, this is the only map I can find of it, of all of it. And it's a map showing where the quarries are in it, which are the green squares. This is a major building stone. And it exists, this is the border between Russia and Finland, and it's on both sides of the border and 99% of the maps you find of it just show the Finnish side which only tells you half the story. Uh, I have crossed this border to look at the granite of Viborg. I'll tell you about that over a pint. <laughs> My one and only nightmarish venture into Russia I only got arrested and then I couldn't I couldn't go around looking at curbstones like I normally do because I knew that would be interpreted as acting strangely. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so, anyway, so this is named after this town, Vyborg, now in Russia, once in Swedish, held Finland, Vyborg. And this rock is called v Vyborgite. And it looks like this. Um, I've got a better picture of it actually later on. It's Finland's national rock, appears on stamps, and it's called Rapakivi granite. And Rapakivi means rotten rock or crumbly rock in Finnish because the surface of these granites are really crumbly, but when you quarry down into it, you get this incredibly coherent granite. And it's made out of quartz, which is black, two feldspars, and there is micro in here, but it's not so obvious. But look at the feldspars. They're pink in the middle. They're like watermelons with green around the outside of them. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. I'll show you a better picture in the middle, in a minute. So the stuff in the middle, uh, the pink stuff, is what we call potassic feldspar or K feldspar. And the green is another kind of feldspar called plagioclase. Now, why this is problematic is that plagioclase crystallises at a much, much higher temperature, like a 1,000 degrees higher than k feldspar. So you should be getting the, the padge in the middle and the k feldspar on the edges, mm -hmm. but no, it's the wrong way around. So this has been interpreted as two pulses of magma coming in. So one coming, so basically it's starting to crystallise nice big k feldspar phenocrysts, or conductor of phenocrysts, big crystals, and then another pulse of magma, hotter, has come in, eroded those crystals, made them into balls, and then deposited plagioclase on the outside. We don't, we don't really know how these form, because this is another example. We've got these so-called ovoids, pink in the middle, green on the outside. Now this is what we call an enclave. And this is a chunk of rock that Basically, this is the material the melt intruded into, the country rock, if you like. But look at that, there's a bloody ovoid in it. How did that get in there? Because <laughs> this was never molten. What's going on? So it can only have formed after everything had solidified, which just throws everything I've just said totally out of the water. We have no idea what's going on with these things. But these Rapakivi granites, um, often call them A-type granites, which means anorogenic, which in plain English means they were not formed in a mountain building environment like all the other granites I've just shown you. They're actually formed in an area where the crust was extending. They're one and a half billion years old. They only formed one and a half billion years ago. We don't have modern Rapakivi granites. But we know one and a half billion years ago, that was before the Atlantic open, Ocean opened, there was what we call a Rapakivi granite continent, a stripe of these granites, which went all the way from Fenniscandia, from, from Finland, all the way down to guess where? Texas. And this is the other end of uh, Rapakivi continent. These are town mountain granites, 
This is how they outcrop. Again, balloon-shaped granites, but all connected to a batholith below. Slightly different colour, but pink, green on the outside. Not very similar. And you'll remember these because of my next slide. Elvis Presley's gravestone. <laughs> made out of Rapakibi granite. <laughs> Not many people can claim that. <laughs> so if you ever go to Graceland, you can go, mm, look at that. <laughs> so yeah, these weird shapes in this Rapakibi granite brings me on to kind of the next section of my talk. We're getting near the end now. Shapes in granites. So, you know, granites don't all look the same. So I'm just going to show you some of the more weird and wonderful. These are called orbicules, and they form orbicular granites. And these are about 15 or so centimetres diameter, really beautiful structure, very, quite rare. And this is some orbicular granite from uh, Finland. I love it in German, it's called Klotz granite. <laughs> <laughs> pa pa what's it, Palur graniti. Sounds a lot more kind of poetic, I think. But these are these orbicles, and you know, this makes an incredibly beautiful decorative stone, which is not used enough, in my opinion. Um, so there isn't a scale there, but to say these are about 15 or so centimetres in diameter. Very distinctive texture. Not to be confused with these circular features we get in Rapakibi granites, which are called ovoids. So here we have this is classic Weibelgeite from um, southeast Finland. Well, we see this pink feldspar with the rim of green feldspar outside it. And as I say, we don't really understand how these granites form. But much more frequently, we, we see features called phenocrysts. And a phenocryst is a large crystal in an overall finer grained matrix. What I'm showing here, this is a prasans. Beautiful, beautiful phenocrystic granite. A nice cross-shaped feldspar twins in it. Uh, this is a, another Texan granite. And again, it's quite coarse grain granite, but with big phenocrysts. And we get a good idea of what the shape of the crystal is here as well. And of course, this is a big feature of the Cornish granites. David and I are always in search of white crosses. <laughs> this is on um, London Bridge. Uh, it's probably Merivale granite, this, on the Caravettes, rather than the Lank, though. That's some, that's some of the talk. And then phenocrysts can be really big. So these ones that I've shown you, you know, they're about two, three, four centimetres kind of size. And then if they get over five centimetres, we call them megacrysts. And unfortunately, I can't put a, couldn't put a scale on this because there's a really deep drop between me and that wall. Uh, this is at Vintner's House, Fishman, sorry, Fishmingers Hall, I should say, Fishmingers Hall, on um, the north side of London Bridge. And these crystals are a good 15 centimetres in length. And this is so-called giant granite from Dartmoor. This is black tourmaline, which is the extra mineral to our triad of feldspar quartz and mica. And then we get these things that we shouldn't get in granite. So I mentioned this enclave when I showed you that picture of that Rapakibi granite with the ovoid inside one of these things. So these are relics of older melts or the country rock that the granite was intruded into and it's dragged it up with it. And these are things to look out for. What do you call them, David, as quarrymen here? Bugs, I think. Bugs. Yeah, yeah, bugs. Yeah. Quarrymen call them all sorts of names. In the north of England, in the Shap granite, for example, they call them heathens. <laughs> <laughs> These are all examples in Cornish granite. This is the paving in Covent Garden. And in London, we've got a big chunk of Killis, your local country rock, sitting in here. It hasn't really melted at all. You know, you can still see the original structure of these rather slaty, banded rocks. So, you know, there's something, something to look out for. I think hot quarrymen probably hate them because they they'll throw all your calculations about the hardness and homogeneity of a granite out. And then we get other big crystals. These are pegmatites. So these are crystals bigger than five centimetres, usually found in, in, in veins. This is down at McGilliger, just 
mile or so down the coast from here. Don't go there unless it's very low tide, but absolutely astonishing granite pegmatites to be seen there. Great big topazes in them as well. Not gem quality though, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> and then look at this. Can you imagine having that in your lounge? Fantastic. I'd kill for one of these, I really would. So these, these slabs, these are your standard kitchen countertop sail slabs, which are about two metres high by about three metres long, to give you some idea. And these come from Brazil, obviously. Well, obvious to me, I suppose. Only in Brazil do you get anything like this, as bling as this. You know, you can see this kind of metre scale feldspars, or if you prefer it in blue, blue feldspars in this case, Amazonite. This is Tiffany's signature stone. If you go to their cafe and their shop in New York, it's all clad with this. So just to finish off in the last five minutes, we're going to talk about the shaping of granite. And some of you are going to come with David and I, there he is, in full flight, um, on a walk tomorrow. And all of these kind of characters that I've told you about granite really feed into how it behaves as a cultural material. It's what we call a freestone. That means it has a homogeneous texture in all directions. It doesn't have any particular plane of weakness. So it can be cut and carved in any direction. It's really strong, um, what we call high compressive strength. So that means compressive strength is dropping a load on something and pressing it down until it breaks. And granite will do that after about 240 megapascals. Now megapascal is not a familiar unit, but just out of comparison, something like Portland limestone will fail at 40 megapascals, so five times stronger than good building limestones. And the same with tensile and flexural strength. St strength? Strength. That's how much it will bend and warp. And we know from our lovely flat paved stone, paving stones here in Helston that it isn't doing that. So incredibly good properties, but it's very hard and that is all down to the high quartz component in it. Quartz is a very hard mineral. But that also makes it very resistant to weathering. It's also frost resistant, water resistant, and many granites take a good polish. And it also breaks up into what we call orthogonal joints. So this cartoon demonstrates that. This is kind of a weathering profile of granite from the surface. So the yellow is kind of soil, dirt, china clay, and this is deeper down. But you can see that it breaks up into tors. We know this. You know this if you live around here. And we tend to get these joints that are at 90 degrees to each other. And here's an example of a little tor at Rinsey Cove breaking up in exactly this way. And this makes granite good to extract because you can the joint size controls the size of block you can get out from it. And the Cornish granites are particularly good examples because they are generally well-spaced joints. I mentioned the um, Leicestershire granites that can only be used for cobblestones. That's because their joints are only cobblestone spaced. But our Cornish granites are much, much bigger. And this is a really famous photo of the biggest block of granite ever extracted. It's in the Royal Corn Cornwall Museum archives at Polkanugo, just up the road. Um, 2,738 tonnes, the whole workforce, back in the days when quarries employed that many people, uh, could sit on it. How are they going to get down, I don't know. But yeah, huge block sizes. And I just want to put in this example. This is a, so the Metropolitan Water Troughs are something we get all over London, and they were put there by Victorian do-gooders who wanted to make sure the cows going to Smithfield Market to be slaughtered and butchered would have a nice drink on the way there as we've been marched through London. And this is the one outside Smithfield Market. Smithfield is just across the road. And it's really hard to photograph because of all the cars and everything. <laughs> but this is about how it's almost four metres long. That's a single block of granite that has been hollowed out. And you get these things all over London and they're usually about a metre and a half long at the most. This is immense. So just talking of London and granites, <laughs> Literally, the last bit of my tour is just a project that I've been working on recently with some of my colleagues at University College London, Matt Howland and Oliver Wilton, who are architects. 
and they the other big thing that's going on in London at the moment is our Victorian sewers are being sorted out finally and there it is called the Thames Tideway project and the picture on the bottom left shows them working this is the old basil jet sewer that this is being completely reinforced and parts of it will be removed and replaced and this is the Thames Embankment wall which was built in around about um, 1865 by Joseph Bazalgette and um, this is when the, the Thames was first controlled and this happened because it, it was just an open sewer before that and of course it flows right past the Houses of Parliament and I think in 1856 was the summer of the Great Stink where they couldn't sit in Parliament because the smell was so bad and so they called in Bazalgette and the Metropolitan Board of Works and said embank it and um, so I've done quite a bit of work on looking at embankment granites which I won't go into now but Oliver and Matthew were commissioned to do something with the, the stone this Victorian stone that had been removed and they've put in this installation of granite blocks called uh, From Thames to Eternity and I'll show you some pictures of this and they're seating areas of public seating in the city of London but first of all, all this stone that came off the embankment was dumped in a field in Essex. I went down there with Oliver to try and identify the granite. And I went there feeling quite boring, thinking I'm good on granites. And I think, traumatised now, absolutely traumatised. So, so many different things and not what I was expecting. And this was, you know, basically they built this too fast. Uh, Lundy granite actually agreed to supply the embankment with all the granite it needed but they were lying <laughs> and went bust and didn't supply a single bit but basil jet thought we're sorted and then he had to put our massive call to every granite quarry in the british isles and in northern france say give me granite in big block sizes now and um so the builder which is i love it probably the most boring, boring periodical in the world but uh, <laughs> like Victorians oh, it's just great, you find all sorts of interesting stuff but not enough various places, Ireland, Scotland, Penryn and Dartmoor, well I could have told you that I kind of want a bit more <laughs> precise, so I spent hours staring at these granites, well it did say pink granites come from below the waterline and I've never seen these before because of course I've never been below the waterline so these ones I can recognise this is Peterhead granite from North West Scotland, we've got some of that in Helston and Ross of Mull, um, sorry, North East Scotland, Peterhead and Ross of Mull from the Isle of Mull in North West Scotland. And then there are all these grey granites, including this really threw me Spanish granite from uh, Portugal or Spain, Porino. And this was only quarried from the 1970s, really. So it's what, what's it doing? It probably was. When they jacked up, um, the embankment, we increase the height of the embankment when they put the Thames barrier in. We think that it's not recorded anywhere, but we think they must have put a row of this granite, which was all the rage at the time, was really, you know, a really important granite in then. But we get these Irish granites, this is what Dublin is built off, huge <coughs> silver muscovites in them, it's really distinctive. You get grey granites from Scotland and also from Guernsey, we get Dalbiti granite, and we get a lot of Cornish <coughs> granites, this, and Devon granites, this particular example is uh, Merivale from Dartmoor. But these are what these seats look like, they're just big blocks of granite. And they went in and immediately people just thought they'd been there forever <laughs> and started sitting on them. And it's really lovely, and we've been using this for outreach, and uh, so I've been giving walking tours of these granites and making out what they are. <laughs> and you know, trying to identify them. Loads of people come along, it's fantastic. And um, people love granite. I can make people love granite. And uh, thank you all for listening. <laughs>
a scientific look at it, but then that kind of lovely bit of kind of cultural space at the end as well there. And, mm -hmm. and I think amazing to see a kind of global context to something. Granites are everywhere. Yeah, granites mm -hmm. are everywhere, absolutely. And I think, and then just to sort of see that sense of the formation and yeah, all that detail. So thank you ever so much. <coughs> it was Pleasure. awesome. And I can't wait for tomorrow morning when we go and stare at some <laughs> tiny things. Um, so yeah, I think we just have a little bit of an opportunity yeah, for some Yeah, if anybody's got any questions, some questions I'm happy would be to take really, questions. really great. Yep. Um, so anybody, hands up. Anybody want to uh, challenge Ruth on science, then I'll give you, give you that for <laughs> the challenge. Yeah, or any other questions. So, uh, yes? Yeah. Yes, I mean, you talked about the, the water affecting the melting The melting, point. yeah. How does it do that? Ju I, well, that, that's <laughs> metaphysics. I can't talk you through the <laughs> physics of that. Um, but it just lowers the pressure. A bit like putting salt in a boiling pan of water, you know, it will reduce the boiling point. It's the same sort of effect, but I'm not a good enough physicist, actually, mm -hmm. to be able to give you the, the ins and outs of that thermodynamic okay. process. But yes, w adding water to granite reduces its melting point. Mm. So is that a bit like a flux? Kind of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. But, yeah, ask David. Yeah. And, oh, that's David will now take questions on my yeah, talk. Yeah, flux, that's it. <laughs> yeah, I'll yeah, do. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fantastic. Mm. Yeah, okay. There was a question over yeah, there. Yeah, I was just curious. You said about there's granite in Houston from North Scotland, North West Scotland. And when it's as rich as it is in granite here, is that an aesthetic decision or a supply decision? Why would Scottish granite end up? Well, you tell me that is a very good <laughs> question. It was probably an aesthetic decision because it's pink. Mm -hmm. And there isn't any pink granite in the Cornubian Batholith, in the Cornwall and Dartmoor Batholith. A little bit of Trollsworthy in the southwest, west <laughs> uh, Dartmoor. But we don't have pink granite. And, and this Peterhead granite was also one of the first to... Um, be experimented on for polishing technology, which originated actually in Dalbeatie in South West Scotland, but then Aberdeen became the centre of granite polishing and cutting columns. No. It's a true fact. And actually, they send, granite would be sent from Scandinavia, from South Africa. There's a place in South Africa called Bon Accord, and Bon Accord is the motto mm. of Aberdeen, mm. and it's named after Aberdeen because... They ship. They well, actually, it was a gabbro, but we're not going to we're not going to <laughs> cut corners. But they ship the rock from the Bon Accord area around um, Pretoria in South Africa to to Aberdeen for cutting and polishing, and then ship it back. Yeah. <laughs> this still happens today, incidentally, with other rocks, mm -hmm. but we won't go there. It's appalling. Uh, but yeah, so um, I think there was an aesthetic choice. They wanted little fancy pink granite columns, and it's on the um, Presbyterian Chapel which is quite a fancy building, yeah, like you said. <laughs> bon, bon, bon Accord's also the name of uh, a pneumatic tooling supplier. So is our, it? Our, yeah. our pneumatic chisels are Bon Accord. So oh, anyway. interesting. I wonder if they've got an Aberdeen link. Know. Quite probably, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Could, well, could well be. I really loved your um, three shapings of granite, the shape of granite, the shapes in granite, and how we shape granite. Mm. I was wondering what you think about how granite might shape our future as humans. That is a very good question. I'm thinking particularly of like the elements we might need. Well, there's two answers to that. First of all, granite, because of all these physical properties that it has, that makes it incredibly tough, resistant stone, means it will never go away. So it's a fantastic building stone. And what I really love about uh, Matt and Oliver's project on the Thames is, you know, this stone is being reused. And it was always an agreement of the Thames Tideway project that, that none of this would be crushed and put into concrete aggregate. And there are a couple of other projects in London as well. Um, for example, some of the blocks have gone to um, what was an incredibly run-down council estate in south-west London. And they've used these granite blocks as focus for making green spaces in the council estate where people can sit, you know, and it's, it's non-hostile architecture, mm -hmm. and it's really worked. It's really worked. People go and sit on them and have chats and look at the flowers and gorilla garden around them. And, you know, so that's, that could be any stone, of course, but it happens to be granite. So this stone can be reused. It can be cut and reshaped and reused in other buildings again. And that is certainly happening 
in architecture. I teach at the Architectural Association about stone in architecture and, they, and they've got a real interest there in teaching their stone students about reuse of stone and materials. And uh, it's a really interesting programme to teach on actually and it's really great to see these young architects thinking about all materials being reusable and recycling a whole building. And if you want to look at some examples, there's a fantastic company, I think they're based in Holland, called Rotor, R-O-T-O-R, who are kind of real creative architects and they salvage all this material and build the most beautiful buildings with it. Um, so it can go on and on and on and on. You don't need to quarry any more granite, you just need to salvage it well. Obviously, it won't keep you in a job, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it is a stone that should never be thrown away. It can be used again. And so, it was, and I was also going to say something else about how it. What was the second part of your question? How it shapes us. About the elements that we can yeah. Them. So yeah, I mean that's really really important, and particularly here in Cornwall. So you know, if we want sustainable fuel sources stop using hydrocarbons, we're going to be reliant on electricity and batteries. And uh, these critical elements, as they're so called, that are needed to make mobile phones, to make batteries, to make all this tech that you know, makes wind farms work, work, that makes geothermal energy pumps work, everything requires minerals like lithium and organic granites here in Cornwall rammed, rammed with lithium. These, these ones, this is Leinster granite um, from a quarry called Three Rock, uh, about 20 kilometres southwest of Dublin. And again, you know, it's, it's distinctive because it's got these enormous dinner plate, well, not quite, <laughs> my sorry, dinner plate pieces of uh, muscovite in them. And again, these are it's what we call a peraluminous granite. They're granites that had a load of water in them when they melted, and that water mobilised all these elements like lithium and mainly lithium, but other things like boron, beryllium, all sorts of weird and wonderful elements, uh, and then concentrated them in these granites or disseminated them throughout these granites. So yeah, really important resources. And, and Jules, you were telling me earlier that you'd heard of uh, a geothermal project where when they're pumping the water through the Cornish granites and it comes up hot, it dissolves the lithium on the way out. So you don't even need to quarry the granite. You can then separate it out of the water, which I think is just fantastic. <coughs> I hadn't heard of that before, but that is, that is a really great thing. So these, yeah, this, you know, there's two ways of looking at this. Um, it suddenly made quarrying granite in Cornwall commercial again. Mm -hmm. oh, I'm just going to leave it at that. <laughs> Question at the back. Um, can I ask um, why there is sometimes an embargo on quarrying granite in Cornwall? I don't know enough about your local politics to be able to answer that. No, I wonder if it's PC or not. <laughs> well, no, I don't, I don't even know if it is. I just don't know the answer. I don't know what, I don't know what is controlling that. No. I mean, I suppose it's supply and demand. I mean, generally, we're taught about whether, you know, mines or quarries are successful in terms of, you know, basically whether the cost of the stone or the mineral is more than the cost of extracting it. Yeah. And if that balance changes, then mines become pointless. But as I say, I don't know what's driving that locally. I no. just don't have that local knowledge, I'm afraid. Sorry. I, I, think, I think there's a sort of, like, a, you know, like with the Cornish granite industry, it was massively impacted by the development of concrete and also kind of Scandinavian granites becoming much more sort of viable. And, uh, and I think the thing that's sort of happened to, to, to Cornwall's granite industry, maybe less so than some of the Scottish granite industry, is that the infrastructure for quarrying and the skills for quarrying and masoning in granite kind of just declined rapidly from the sort of 1950s, 60s onwards to the point where the, the skill base and the knowledge base for working the granite as a, a commercially viable material on a big scale kind of diminished to such a level. Yeah. So it, it kind of that infrastructure kind of massively declined the, the Cornish granite industry, or the lack of infrastructure. So, you know, it's kind of really, you know, to the point where there's kind of one small quarry up the road, which is Tim Marsh's, which is like a, you know, still traditionally used sort of techniques and, and processes. There was a little quarry up in Bodmin that opened up, and I don't know if it's still open, there was masons working up there. 
And then there's Delank, which is a big quarry for granite and a beautiful granite. But there's not a lot of traditional masonry going on at Delank. They're, they're owned by another, I think, a Welsh firm. Um, so, that, but they pro so it's that kind of infrastructure and that kind of balance of infrastructure and economic kind of changes globally. So, you know, little kind of Cornish granites were affected by global material productivity yeah. to the point where we can't produce granite at a big scale for big industrial, for big, for big builds. So it's, it, but it's, it's the arguments are around whether, you know, what happens if, if they opened up all the Cornish granite quarries that are sort of redundant or overgrown? Is that, is that great? Because a lot of those quarries are really, the biodiversity mm -hmm. is kind of really, it's, they're, they're amazing sites of biodiversity and the people live around them. So, you know, it, the, there's a kind of, it's hugely political, hugely everybody's li daily livelihoods are affected so that notion of extraction of of the the kind of environmental and economic viabilities it's very very complex I and think. silica dust is really and, bad and for silica you. dust is <laughs> not good for you at all yeah. so it you know what there are these really human qualities to thinking about extraction and usage and value so the idea of reuse and kind of recycling you know is is really a wonderful thing because that's what this material is so viable for constant reuse um, and you can reshape it we we're always reshaping old coins or stuff at Tim's quarry to do different things um, so it, it, it can be a, a, a kind of very viable option thank you David On. the when it breaks into blocks of mm -hmm. different sizes do we know why it's in different sizes so some of them are cobblestone size yeah. and some of them are yeah, it, huge. It, it depends on local factors of formation and how much rock was on top of them and how mm. strong the granite is in itself. And yeah, some, some tend to join finally, others don't. Okay. It's just the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah, I just wondered whether yeah. it was... Mm. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, it's cooling rate, depth of burial, all different factors can have an influence on this. The other idea I grew up with about granite, apart from the dome-shaped bacillus, yeah. was that the granites with big crystals in them mm. cooled very slowly and the fine granite cooled very quickly. Is that also nonsense? No, it isn't, uh, to a certain extent. <coughs> so, um, talking of the gen general grain size of granite, the coarser grained it is, the, co the slower it cooled. However, these big anomalous big crystals called phenocrysts I mentioned, they're a different story altogether and probably represent a, a later stage of growth, probably brought in by the same fluids that brought in things like lithium, actually. So they, they're a more complex part of the story. So they're separate from that cooling history, but that is absolutely still true, yes. I'm just wondering how much if it's measurable, but the pace or rate that new granite is being made, is it exponentially the same? What's going on in the relationship between what now we see and how much is being made from the mantle? In well, the I could give you a whole hour lecture on this. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> right, so um, um, a colleague called Nick Petford wrote this paper in 2000 where he drilled, well, not literally, but, you know, he looked at so much data of granite all over the world. He's a really good mathematician as well, which I'm not. Um, so he kind of ca looked at all granites and calculated cooling rates and placement rates, how long these different processes lasted. And um, it can take anything from about 10 to 60 million years right. to form a granite and for it to cool. And that depends where it was in the crust. That's what you were just saying now about cooling rates. Um, you know, if it's higher up in the crust, it'll cool quicker. If it's lower in the crust, it'll cool slower. Slower. If it's feeding volcanoes, it's going to cool quicker as well. Sorry, I've lost track of your question. But it's, it? So it's it's constantly being made. Yes. And then emerging. Yeah. And we're seeing sometimes something that might be relatively young. And yeah. Sometimes. Well, it's, it's, it's forming today. It's still forming today in the but Himalayas. Yeah. It's yeah. It's mm -hmm. still there. Yeah, so that's the point at which there's. Yes, but the, the core of the question I'm getting at is this sort of, this is a, a material that has an endless lifespan yeah. until the mantle... And as we've seen from these out. minerals in it, these zircons, they're totally billions recycled billions, yeah. throughout the whole of Earth history, you know, matter is not being 
So we'll always Destroy have it. granite. We'll always, always have, have granite, granite yeah. And um, so they are growing mm. today. And they, you know, we get granites obviously growing in places we can't see them growing. It's totally inaccessible, so we can only speculate and use mathematical models, you know, under the Himalayas, yeah. under the Andes, uh, certainly, under the Rockies, almost certainly. Um, and, you know, in places like Japan, where they are Andean type granites in that they often feed volcanoes, like Mount Fuji. Uh, but I had a, a colleague uh, went to Japan early winter and he showed me this great photo he'd taken of, you know, there'd been a light snow footfall, but I think he was a plane flying over Japan and you could see where the granites were because there were these kind of round shapes yeah. where the snow and, and it, it was all steaming mm -hmm. and it was like oh, 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 that's not very deep is it you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, and yeah you know so they are they are happening now but it, you know but yeah it turns to your question really fully it's very difficult because they are mostly happening in places that are totally inaccessible to us we know more about the surface of venus than we do what's happening 30 kilometers down in the crust there are no granites forming below me <laughs> We're all right at the moment. You do need active mountain belts <laughs> to be getting that constant crystal thickening going. We're not deep enough here. Just oh, yeah. back. Can I sort of ask two questions in one? Yeah, you might have to remind me because, as you, as you can see, my memory too. <laughs> um, is it is it possible to have a granite that's soft if it if it's got n not much quartz in it? Um, I As in the solid? Yeah, well, like, the reason yeah, I well, ask is I ended up with loads of stone from a hotel in Truro. Right. That's from Polyphon. Or yeah, oh, right, yeah, Polyphon. And it's really yeah. dark. And yeah, that's I not thought, granite. Is it soft? Is it not granite? It's not granite. Because well, granite has to have quartz in it. It has yeah, to be so hard. So Polyphon stone, I think, is some kind of weird... It's a slightly weird version of the lizard serpentinite but it's been through the mill more, if I remember yeah, rightly. Soft, yeah, soft and it's very and soft and easy to carve and easy yeah. to polish. And it's not a granite yeah, because of all those granite. things. Yeah. And then yeah. the, other, the other question yeah. is, when did you realise you first loved rocks? <laughs> 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 so I've known Catherine Grantham, a bit older than Catherine. I've known her since, I've known her since she was born. And our, we, the reason we know each other is that both our dads are mountaineers, climbers. <laughs> And um, Catherine was a lot better at climbing than I was. And I <coughs> used to go climbing with your dad. And um, it was a case of just look in front of you, just look in front of you. <laughs> <laughs> and keep going. Don't look down, don't look at, don't look sideways, just, oh, look at that. <laughs> and I remember halfway at the Edwell Slabs. Suddenly, seen this absolutely beautiful quartz crystal, yeah. um, but I had to keep going. <laughs> so that's how it was being a really, really poor rock climber that got me into rocks. <laughs> that is the honest truth. It's all my dad's fault. Um, can I ask a question about the zircons? Yes. Yeah. Um, I love zircons. I know. I, I sensed you did. Yeah. But, um, how how do you date them? Right, so have you heard of radiocarbon dating? Yes. So carbon changes, carbon has a different isotope, a different weight. Atoms of carbon weigh slightly different depending on whether they formed in, whether they are in a living thing or whether they're in a dead thing. And if you can calculate the ratio of the, if you like, the dead carbon to the living carbon, you can work out how long something has been dead for or how old a tree is, you know, like a tree. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the basic principle of radiometric dating. Now, carbon dating is only useful over a very short, geologically speaking, <laughs> time scale. It's only useful over an archaeological time scale. So we have to look at what we call other radioactive clocks, um, decay series of in um, um, radioactive, that's the word, <laughs> radioactive elements. Um, and we need to look at radioactive decay theories, how's your physics? That, right, okay. right. <laughs> They've got a long half-life that take a long time to decay from, say, uranium down to lead. Mm -hmm. Okay? And we need something that is a half-life that is equivalent to the age of the Earth, because anything shorter than that will not enable us to date. So half-lives of radiometric 
decay our well-known physical principles, right? And so if you have, um, there is a standard equation by which you can kind of work out the half-life. If you rearrange that in terms of time, you can find out how old something is. So there's a bit of mathematical manipulation here, but basically what you do is you get your zircon. Now the technique that I, I, I was a geochronologist with a PhD, um, and we use a technique called fish and track, and it's a good one to describe because it's very obvious. So these zircons and another mineral called apatite that are rich in uranium. And they ended when uranium underwent nuclear fission within the crystals. And as it did that, it left a little scar on the crystal, two or three microns long. So what we would do is we would polish the crystals and etch them to show the scar and count them. And that would give us the amount of uranium that had undergone fission since that mineral formed. Then we'd send the same crystal off to a nuclear reactor and cause all the rest of the uranium to fission, count that, and then use the ratio one to the other to find out how old the rock was. <laughs> it was a bit like when you, know, you know, when you see, like, it always reminded me of those films where you see kind of somebody flying in a helicopter over a, a herd of wildebeest in the Serengeti and clicking, counting them all. That was what it was like when we down the microscope, counting radiation damage. So that's kind of an obvious way, but you can also measure the amount of radiation in a crystal, how much has decayed and how much hasn't decayed, and ratioing that will give you the age of the rock. Mm -hmm. It does get a bit more complicated than that because it can be reset by temperature, but if for zircons and dating granites, mm -hmm. we use a technique called uranium lead, which looks at that decay from uranium to lead. And that has a very long half-life, and it also has what we call a very high closure temperature, so the clock isn't reset by a second phase of melting. It's, you know, you need two, three thousand degrees to reset it, not a thousand degrees. So that's how we do it. Thank you. <laughs> I hope that sort of makes sense. It's not the easiest thing to explain. Any more questions? I think Teresa might have a chilled beer for me. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody.